Okay, so I uh, put together a spreadsheet and some Python code here to look at advection and dispersion modeling, also called advection diffusion modeling, depending on the context. Uh, and I thought I would make a video about how this uh, Python tool is set up. So uh, this tool is going to be freely available online on GitHub and you can you don't need to install any software to view it to see how it works if you do want to work with it you need to use the anaconda python distribution you can use it directly and it, that's completely free um, and python is all open source so anyway let's walk through this really quickly so I gave some students in my class a problem where I wanted them to work with an Excel spreadsheet. And we haven't really talked much about making Python, so uh, this isn't really the way you would do it for that class, but it really is a much better way to solve this problem. So I'll go through both the Python implementation and the spreadsheet here just for pedagogical purposes. Anyway, so I put this together. So, you know, lab columns are commonly used for studying the fate and transport of uh, solutes and porous media. So if you're trying to understand how some chemical sorbs onto a medium, you know, in groundwater or in sediments, you might want to run some kind of a study where you have a little column and you have flow that goes through the column and you can try to understand if it's being degraded by microorganisms there or by some other chemical reaction or uh, maybe it's sorbing onto the medium. Anyway, if you want to do that, you can run a, a column. That's going to be one way that you could study that. But part of when you start working with columns, you have to also understand the flow. So you need so if you have flow going in one side of a little column like a cylinder and then coming out the other end, um, you're, you can take samples of what comes out of the end of the column and you can analyze those for the chemical concentration. Well, then you need to go back and interpret the data that you found using some kind of a model. So oftentimes, so one factor that's going to be important there is going to be the flow characteristics. And oftentimes uh, you will run a tracer first just to try to understand how the water flows through a column, or it could be air, I suppose, uh, any other medium, whatever might be going through the column, but I mostly think about water. But um, anyway, so you might run a tracer study, and then you might, you know, use an advection diffusion model. You might also add in the sorption and reaction to that model later when you're trying to study it. But for the tracer, the idea is you get rid of that stuff and you just look at the flow, which is going to be the advection, which is basically just the flow uh, movement with the bulk medium and then dispersion which is the spreading out of that chemical as it moves through the porous media due to different flow paths being shorter and longer so this model would describe that one so if you wanted to quickly use this tool for doing a calculation you just need to you know you need the Jupyter tools in anaconda python uh, you can simply run I'll just do the quick run through. You just need to run this cell. Now I have certain values in here. If you change the the parameters, then you have to rerun it. So you'd have to run this cell again. This imports the functions you need and it defines the parameter values. Then you need to go down here and find the eigenvalues of the function, which is actually not in that cell, but in this next one here, it finds the eigenvalues. And then at the end here, you can look at the concentration profiles or the effluent breakthrough curve for the column. So we're going to try to explain this. Uh, I've got it detailed step by step, but if you wanted to use it, you just need those three to run those three cells once you have this Python stuff installed. And again, this is all free and open source scientific software. It's for you know the public. OK, so um, the model problem here, just yeah, imagine we have a column where we have some solute coming through. I am going to work the example here with 100 milligram per liter, a concentration coming in. The column initially has none of this chemical. So for example, we might look at like bromide and anion might be a good tracer flowing in. And this one is 30 centimeters long. And then I figured out that the velocity in the column is 10 centimeters per hour. And then the dispersion coefficient is 100 centimeters per hour. Now, in reality, I'd probably be trying to figure these things out 
with the test, but you have to be able to work the problem you know, forward before you can go backwards and, and figure out what the parameters are from data later. So, so this is an example of just how to go through, assuming we know these parameters and get the breakthrough curve. And this is what we want. We just want a curve that shows uh, the concentration going up. So if I start flowing it in, it's initially zero. After a while, this stuff is going to start coming out this end, and I want to be able to predict it. Pretty straightforward problem. Now, unfortunately, the math that goes into this can be very complicated. So that's why I put this together. All right, so I'm not going to spend tons of time on the math. Uh, there's other you know, videos that need, would need to be done on that. This is mainly about how you would use the math to get to that curve in this implementation. So, so again, the parameters of this model are going to be the concentration that's flowing into this influent, the velocity in the column, the dispersion coefficient in the column, and then how long it is. From this information, we can predict what this curve is going to look like. That's the idea. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do if I'm going to work it in Python, this cell up here is called a markdown cell. So these are used. You can, you know, make a nice table like I did. You can insert a diagram. You can format the text, all that stuff. Also, you can make formatted equations, which I have down below. So th that's just basically descriptions, a description cell. And so now if we want to run it in Python, I have to go in here and define it. So I've created these variables here in Python. C0 for the initial concentration, U, velocity, D, L, N. So if you wanted to look at different values of the influent concentration of the dispersion coefficient, you have to run this cell again. So you, you, know, you can click on the cell and hit the run button and that will run it. And every time you open the notebook, you have to run the cells to get the next one to run. So this stuff is an input for the following cells. So anyway, first I'm going to go in define those parameter values that I'm using elsewhere, and then I'm also going to go ahead and do my imports of the libraries I'm going to use. So I'm using numeric Python, NumPy, because I'm doing array calculations here. I'm going to be doing a lot of, this has really got a lot of calculations in it, uh, and arrays are useful for that, and NumPy has some other important math tools in it built in. I'm going to use the scientific Python libraries optimize tool to find the zeros of a function later, and then mathplotting library, matplotlib, to make the graphs. All right, so governing equations. So the governing differential equation for transport of a solute in one dimension, x is the d direction you're going in, c is the concentration at different points in that column, d is dispersion coefficient, u is the velocity. So this is just basically a mass balance. And we're, we're just saying that the mass has to be balanced through the column. All right, to solve this, this is a, a partial differential equation. It's second order in x means that we need two boundary conditions. And it's first order in t means I need one initial condition to be able to solve this. So the initial condition is just going to be that there's no what's happening at the beginning. The concentration at every point inside that column is 0. So that's my initial condition. Boundary condition, there are several that could be used. I have done all this one with this boundary condition, which has been demonstrated to predict the reality of column behavior most accurately. And that is called a, it's a flux matching boundary. So we're saying that the concentration times the velocity coming in, this is the mass entering the column from outside, has to equal the flux right at the start of the column, basically. So there's an advection flux and a diffusion or dispersion flux here at the start of the column, and it has to match only the advection coming in. So this is our flux matching boundary. This kind of makes everything a little bit harder mathematically because this is a mixed boundary condition. It's just a little bit... You know, it, it leads to basically a little bit more messy solutions, but they still exist and they can be used. Again, that's the point of this spreadsheet, uh, or sorry, Jupyter Notebook here. So our last one then is also a little bit messy. There's not a perfect one, but this one works, has been demonstrated to uh, most accurately predict real data. And it's just saying basically the diffusion flux is negligible. So the diffusion flux is the d, d, c, d, x by Fick's law. And if d, d, c, d, x is 0, then we we know d isn't 0. So that means that the derivative there has to be 0. It means basically it's got to be flat at the right side of the, or at the outlet side of the column. The, the concentration profile is 
kind of constant right there at the end. So those are my boundary conditions. Uh, it's easier to solve this problem. Students don't like uh, non-dimensionalization, but it really is a very powerful tool. Um, and so I'm going to take, instead of working with the actual time, I'm going to work in dimensionless time, dimensionless distance by dividing it by the length of the column, and then dimensionless concentration. Uh, this really allows me to solve a lot of problems with one problem. So um, if I scale up the concentration or scale up the distance, I still don't, I don't have to go back and rework the whole problem. So, you know, it's kind of handy to do it this way. Um, and really everything then boils down to when you non-dimensionalize it, the, this Peclet number, which is the ratio of the importance of the advection, which is flow going in one direction versus dispersion, which acts to spread that out basically. The Peclet number is going to tell us that and that's UL over D. Uh, so when you do that, you these are our resulting uh, non-dimensional equations. These equations have been solved in the past. You can do it with separation of variables. This could also be done with Laplace transforms, maybe other kinds of um, complex variable transformations. Uh, I'm not going to go over that here. Just the point is you know, for, you know, I'm an engineer and um, I want to be able to, I find this solution that somebody spent a lot of time to try to figure out. This would be a very difficult problem to solve. Somebody has done it for me and now I want to make use of that. Okay, but it's not trivial to make use of this solution because as you can see, it's got an infinite sum. It's got a cosine, a sine, an exponential. It's got a lot of stuff here. So how in the world are we going to actually make use of this to go back to our relatively simple problem of, just predicting what's going to come out of that column, assuming I know these uh, parameters. So this is my solution, uh, and it has these beta terms. So it's got an infinite series. So how the heck do I use an infinite series? Well, I can just use part of it. So I might just use the first 100 terms. That's the way I've set it up. Uh, up at the top, you can change the number of terms. If you want to look at just using the first term, that, that actually can work pretty well after a while but uh, you can use as many as you want. I've set it up with 100. Uh, so we're going to use 100 terms, and then we have to figure out the values of this beta. And so beta basically is what's called an eigenvalue, and these terms here in the series are called eigenfunctions. And so they're all basically used to satisfy the uh, boundary conditions. We need uh, eigenfunctions that satisfy that. And then their sum is used to come up to solve the initial conditions. So um, Sometimes we can get these eigenvalues in a more straightforward way if the boundary conditions are not very messy. In this one, we had those messy boundary conditions. So the, the actual values of beta here in each of these terms from 1 to infinity are determined by solving this equation, finding the roots of uh, this equation for beta. All right, so and this equation again comes from implying the boundary conditions to this problem. All right, so I'm not going to go over uh, how, where all these came from, just saying we found this solution. There are so many different solutions. You know, there are books you can use to look up solutions, but once you have them, then you have to be able to use them. That's what this, uh, sp uh, this uh, worksheet is designed to do. Okay, so, um, all right, so for example, this would be a much simpler one. If you have constant concentration boundary conditions, you end up with your eigen uh, eigenvalue problem is just to find sine of beta L equals zero, in which case we know where sine is zero at n pi over L. Uh, any of those will give you a zero. So now you've solved it directly. Uh, but up here, we can't solve it directly because this function has no direct analytical solution like that. So we have to go and solve this numerically. All right. So, um, so the way that I have set this up is I said I'm going to create a function here, and that's the eigenvalue uh, expression up above, and it really depends only on the Peclet number and beta. So this is, again, one more reason why you'd want to non-dimensionalize it. You'd have three things here. It just becomes more messy from a coding point of view uh, to have more things to work with. So we've simplified the problem by making it dimensionless. And now we have this function, and we need to find its roots. Where is it zero? So if you look at this function and think about it a little bit, it has this cotangent term. And hopefully you'll remember that the cotangent is equal to the cosine divided by the sine. And you might also remember that sine goes to zero over and over again. So that means that this thing goes haywire. 
every time sine of beta goes to zero. And so where does sine beta go to zero? It's at zero pi, two pi, so on. Every n pi, there's going to be a singularity where this function goes, uh, basically, uh, it's undefined. So in between each of those singularities, there is a zero value, and those are all the things that we need to find. So the first thing that I did in this worksheet to help you think about how we could do this is I wrote a, a little code to just plot the value of this function uh, and then use some of the cool Python tools to graph that. All right, so this code here, uh, we're using matplotlib. If you do this, it will automatically embed the plot results in the here, so that's why that line's there. Here I'm defining that function, so uh, this function has two inputs. The name of it is characteristic, and it returns the value of f up here that I just created, okay? I need the Peclet number to do these calculations, so I'm getting it. Remember, that's why I need to run that cell up above. Before I can run this one, I need U, L, and D, or this one, this cell wouldn't work, okay? Uh, so here, I'm just, I determine the first uh, 10 values, or from 0 to 10, I guess, uh, values of the singularities. So that's pi times 0, pi times 1, pi times 2, and so on. And then in between each of those 11 singularities, that's going to give us 10 uh, values of beta between 0 and pi, pi and 2 pi, uh, 9 pi and 10 pi. And so then I made a plot here of those singularities so that you can see them. If you don't plot it like this, it may be a little bit harder to understand kind of the function. Uh, and then basically I'm just plotting the value of it here. And these are all just a lot of details that I, you know, tried to make the graph look very clear. All right. And then here also plotting the singularities and some arrows to point out where the beta values are that we are trying to find. Okay. So don't, you know, that's all this is, is just some details about how to make plots in Python. Not going to spend a ton of time on that. So, so if you look here, here's our function. And so it's got this cotangent. And the cotangent has this kind of crazy behavior. There's some other parts of it, that function too. But you can see how the cotangent creates this singularity. And I put all those in here with these little dashed lines. And then in between each of the dashed lines, there is the function value. And we need to find where it intersects the x-axis. And so it's right there for the first one, right there for the second and third one, and so on. So if you kind of look over here to the right, you see that they all start getting really close to the uh, next value of pi but they're a little bit bigger. So one way that you can solve this, and I've done this in the Excel spreadsheet, is you have to go through, and it's, it's a little more work to find these in Excel, but you, you find them all. And then once you've gotten to about number 10, you can just assume the next one is pi more than the last one. So the difference between this one and that one is, is pretty close to pi. The difference between this one and the next one would be close to pi, and so on, because you, know, you can see that. Okay, so, but you've got to find at least the first few you need to be exact. Uh, and it's not a big deal to find the exact values of all of them in Python as, you know, one advantage versus, say, Excel. Another advantage being making a cool graph like this. Would be very hard to make this in Excel with Greek characters here, with pi in the, you know, I labeling my singularities and so on. No big deal in Python. I can do it. All right, so what this shows us here, yeah, is our first one was about at 1.54. Yeah, this is basically just explaining what I said. So now how do we actually find them? So what we want to do is, it, you know, we have a, a problem now that we can solve. We know that between 0 and pi, there is a, there's going to be a root of the function between pi and 2 pi. So what I can do is just set up each of those intervals, and I can use a numerical algorithm. Again, I'm not going to go through how the algorithm works. I'm just going to show you how to use it in Python. There's more than one, but we're going to work with Brent's method. i got a link there if you want to read more. Okay, so I went ahead and redefined some of the stuff from the last cell here because you don't really need to run that last cell if you just wanted to use the function. But here we're, so here I'm again computing the Peclet number to make sure we have that and then redefining the function. So to find a root in Python, I need a function with only one uh, input variable here. So I'm embedding the, the value of the Peclet number into this function so that I can solve it. So up above, my characteristic equation had Peclet as an input, but then it, I can't make it work with this Brent's method thing in Python. So uh, anyway, so here are my intervals. So basically, the singularities between 0 and pi and so on. And then I'm going to store the results in a list. 
So I'm basically going to go through each interval. I'm going to find my new beta, and then I'm going to add it to this list. That's the logic. That's what we're doing. Okay, so for I and range intervals, and so I'm stopping one short of the end because you know, remember between 0 and 1 pi, there's a, a 0. Between pi and 2 pi, there's a 0. So in the end, I have uh, 11 singularities. That means I have 10 intervals. So I have to go one less, or I'll get an error. And I went ahead and had the minimum. If I, if I made it right at the interval, it'd be undefined, so that'd be no good. So I, I had it start 10 to the minus 10th power above that interval, and then 10 to the minus 10th before the next one. So a little margin for error in there. And then I'm just, all I have to do is add to the list that I created here. My SciPy optimize gives me access to this Brent function. And then the function takes the thing I'm trying to optimize, which is characteristic, a min and max value, and it returns the root of that. So three inputs, the name of the function, the minimum and the max value, and this whole thing returns the root in that interval. And so then I've got my beta values. So uh, up above, I defined my U, L, and D. Now down here, I run this, and now I've got my betas. And now I'm ready to go and do my you know infinite series in quotes, uh, which is not actually infinite, but we're just going to do the first 100. You could do as many as you want. All right, so here the first thing I wanted to do is to just make a plot and to look at how the concentration profile looks like across the column. So at the beginning, there's no mass in the column, means the concentration is zero everywhere. And we know at the end that it should go up to the influent concentration of you know, 100 in this example. In between, it's going to gradually increase from left to right. Again, we, we, we know all these things is what it should be. So we're just trying to find an equation we can use to work with here. Uh, but so I've again have uh, I'm going to make an embedded plot here of what those profiles look like at different points in time. These are going to be the x values where I'm going to calculate the value of the function. And then these are going to be the times. So what I need to do is go through each time and calculate the value at all the x's. And then at each one of those, I have to make sure I do my summation of all the beta eigenfunction terms using the beta values that I got from the uh, last the last step. Okay, so so here I've defined those eigenfunctions that depend on the value of beta. They also depend on the Peclet number, and they're going to depend on the dimensionless uh, x and t values. And so this function here is the equivalent of, I will quickly go back up and show you that equation again. So remember, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to find the roots of this, which is where this thing is 0. And then once we've gotten each of those, we have to go through and calculate this whole messy thing and add up all the terms. And then we have to multiply it by this and do 1 minus that. And then we have the dimensionless concentration. So, so we've done this part. We figured out beta. Now I need to go back in here and do my sum. And so I'm, you know, in this one I'm doing just 100 terms. But you, know, you can see it's a lot of work to find this. Then it's a lot of work to sum this. And I have to do this at every single point in x and every single point in time. It's a lot of work to solve all this. But not a big deal for a computer. And if you set it up right in Python, this all can be run very quickly. So anyway, I've defined this function here, which depends on the beta, the x, the t, and Peclet number. That's what's in that cell down there. All right, so uh, so that was those. Okay, so that's what this is, just defining that one. And now I'm going to use this thing over and over again down below. So I'm going to store the results here in a nested list. So I'm going to basically have, uh, the for each time, there's going to be a list value of the concentrations for each x. And all, all those it's dimensionless. So all right, so my times I defined. Now I'm going to go through each time. I'm going to figure out the dimensionless time, I'm going to add a new list to my master list. Then I'm going to go through each of the x points. I need to get the dimensionless value. And now I can get the value of the series. I can use all the betas here uh, by using NumPy's array. That basically means it's going to take all 100 of those betas and use that function over and over so that I don't have to run it 100 times. I just give it 100 betas, and it gives me 100 values back. Then in the next step, I just add all those up because that's my summation term. And then that equation, as I showed you just now, has this 2 Pecle EXP uh, X and T term out in front of the series. 
and one minus that. And then my actual concentration, uh, I need to multiply by C0. And so I can add that to the end of this little list. I'm going through here. And then once I fi finish this for one value of T, I go to the next T, I add a new list, and so I'm done. Down here, then, I am plotting this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how to make plots in Matplotlib. Uh, the, you know, so uh, basically, I made it. And this code is all just to make it look the way that I wanted it to. So you can see here, it shows each of the time points at 0. Uh, I didn't actually do this exactly at 0. It's like 0 0.001. But you can see, basically, it starts at 0. And then it goes to completely full of mass at the end. And then it starts coming in here. And it works its way to the right. I mean, this is all just very logical, hopefully, uh, something that can be understood. But the math that goes into making this, as we've seen, is a lot of work. So after 10 hours, we've completely saturated it, basically. Um, so if you were actually you know, going back and thinking about how to use this for science, uh, we would, what we'd really want to do is to compare the model results with some kind of data. And so to do that, we're not really interested in the concentration here at x equals 10 in the column. I mean, you could do that if you had a little way to take a sample at that point in the column, an, an outlet port. But you probably wouldn't have that most of the time. It was a lot of work to put that in. But what you would have is the concentration in the effluent as it is coming out. And so um, so you instead of making this plot, you might want to just get the values at the end of the column right here and plot those over time. So um, how do we do that? Basically, it's very similar. I'm, you know, Again, I defined this stuff that was in the last cell. I redefined it here so that you don't have to depend on running the last cell to redo this one. Uh, I'm plotting it from 0 to 12 hours at 0.1 hour increments in this situation. And then I can go through each value of time, get my dimensionless time. I'm only interested in x star equals 1 uh, because I'm looking at the effluent. I can get my series value and then sum it up again and add it on and then make a plot. And so what does that look like? Here is the result. And so this is exactly the sort of thing we were looking for in the beginning when we solved this. I've also plotted here what this would look like if it was perfect plug flow. So plug flow means that there's no dispersion at all. And so this is, you know, you would get an instantaneous breakthrough at three hours because it's 30 centimeters uh, long and it's three or 10 centimeters per hour. So 30 divided by 10 is three hours. This is when it would come out if you had no dispersion, if all the flow paths links were the same. But in reality, you're going to have this in a real column uh, unless you've got really uniform media. Um, so this just kind of shows that idea. And so once you've done this, now you have predicted what this would look like for a given value of u and d. And so uh, in reality, you might want to try to find the value of d. And you could do that one by doing uh, by trying to minimize the squared error, for example. If you had a bunch of data coming out of here, you'd want to keep adjusting D and running it over and over again until you got the best fit possible. And you know I'm not going to talk about how to do that here. Uh, but it would not be hard to basically build on top of the code I have here a new uh, Python tool that you could use to fit that. Okay, So you would just have to run this whole thing over and over again for different dispersion coefficients to do that. Now, as I mentioned, um, so this, this is all on the web here. You can actually go and look at this. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, on GitHub, so called Column Tracer, if you want to download this and um, work with it yourself. So you can look for my username on GitHub, DJ Lampert, and this is Column Tracer. Uh, I've also put this in Excel, something that you could use. It's very clumsy in Excel, but um, I made that available too. So basically here, once again, I need to define the values of all the parameters here. Um, sometimes dispersion is defined as the product of u and a dispersivity, alpha. And so that's the way I have this one set up. But uh, to do this in Excel, it's, it's difficult because you kind of need three axes. We need to be able to evaluate the eigenfunctions at different eigenvalues, one, different x values, two, different time values, three. So you kind of need like a 3D matrix to really do that. So the way that this is set up is that I'm basically fixing t. Uh, and then I'm calculating at different values of x here the, um, the each of the eigenvalues. So, so I have a column set up here where 
I have an eigenvalue, and in here is the value of the function uh, within the characteristic equation, and this should be zero if I have this right. Now, if I go in here and change the disperse, dispersion coefficient to 100, now my PECLA number changes to 6, and that means that all my roots have to be updated. So I have to go find now all the new values of beta. How would I do that in Excel? You can do that with Solver, where you say, let's say, um, data solver, and then set this value equal to a value of 0 by changing that cell and solve and it did it okay so it changed it to 1.97 and that first one has got to be accurate okay likewise you can go to the next one and so on this is a pain to do in Excel is one reason not to do it here um, but so now I've got uh, my first value of beta now I can get this one make to make that zero and so on this one shows you the difference here you can see how they get closer to pi as you get to bigger and bigger values and so I've got for this time, um, for all these different values of x, I'm getting the values of the eigenfunction for each of these betas. Okay, so like this cell here references this point x star is 0.05, which is in the real domain 1.5, this times the 30 centimeters. And then it also uses this dimensionless time up here. So I can only do, again, I can only do so many things in, in Excel, but... But so this cell is going to use that x, this t, and then this value of beta here. And so I have to then, as you can see from that, so I have to do it for all the betas. And then at the bottom here, I can go and add them all up. And so then once I've added them up, remember, we still had to do some more work after you sum them. There's another term there in exp that you have to deal with. And here is that. So you can see this exp term up here at the top. And that gives me my dimensionless time. And then from here, I've got my real distance and my real concentration that I can use. Okay, so uh, I went ahead and did this for, change this back to what it was before, u times alpha, and let me go ahead and update my beta again. Yeah, solve that again. And, you know, one problem with solver is that it's going to find the closest zero, so um, you have to make sure that your starting value is within that interval every time before you go and do this. So you have to be careful. It'd be easy to miss one. One more reason not to do this in Excel. But, but you can, anyway, it can be done, though. Um, okay, so we've got that set up now. And so here at like t equals 0 .04, 0 0.4 hours, this is our concentration uh, profile here. Uh, so I went and did that here at 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 1, 2, 10, and I got this graph. So the, these are just copied values from that row up above. And I got a graph, as you can see, that looks very similar to the result that I got before. I think the other one I had a value at 4 hours that was kind of in here. But it can be done in Excel. So this is how you do it in there uh, if you wanted to. And so this Excel spreadsheet is also available if you don't want to do Python as another way to solve it. So... That basically covers it. Uh, thank you guys for spending the time to listen.